Walter, you see on the nose of the spacecraft, the docking ring and the probe you were talking about a few minutes ago. And here at the home of Apollo, with Leo Krupp, who is the chief Apollo research pilot for North American Rockwell, it seems the question is, what does this mission mean in terms of the spacecraft, Leo? What are we asking it to do that it hasn't been asked to do before? Well, Bill, for the first time, we're going to actually dock with the lunar module in space. So this will be the first test of our docking system. Uh, also, after docking uh, with the LEM while it's in the S-4B, we will eject it for the first time, checking out the spring ejector system. Following that, uh, we, we're going to do several service propulsion burns with the lunar module attached to the nose of the uh, command service module. And we've never done that before. That's right. That'll be the first time for this. We've done it in the simulator many times, but this will be the first flight test. Uh, after that will be rusty space and uh, spacewalk, of course, to prove that we can go from one vehicle to the other via the outside route. And uh, following that, the, the LEM systems check out and the high point of the entire mission, of course, which is the separation of the lunar module in a manned configuration for the first time where they'll fly out about 100 miles, come back in and do a LEM active rendezvous and a LEM active docking with the command service module. How complicated is this docking, Leo? Well, the docking really isn't too complicated. It's a lot like uh, in-flight refueling in airplanes. On the nose of the spacecraft, we have the, uh, the drogue, which is extended about 10 inches, and the pilot flies in using a target on the lunar module and a sight in his window to uh, mate the probe and the drogue. There are three capture latches in the head of the uh, probe which engage the, the drogue and hold the two vehicle in what we call the soft docking configuration. The probe and drogue are mated. However, the two vehicles are still about 10 inches apart. As soon as Dave Scott has his attitude all aligned, he will then throw a switch in the cockpit which energizes a nitrogen bottle and retracts the probe and pulls the two docking rings smartly together. This releases 12 docking latches, and the two vehicles are then firmly mated in a hard docking configuration. And those 12 latches, Walter, Leo assures me, are a good bet to, <laughs> to go all at once. I asked him whether 11 out of 12 would be a reasonable guess. He said, no, 12 for sure. Certainly, we're counting on it. Uh, I believe it is true that if, uh, if they don't catch, uh, uh, the pilots can throw them manually, can't they, uh, Leo? Uh, that's right, Walter. We have a, an indicator in the cockpit which will tell us if we have uh, six of them uh, made it or not. And regardless of what the indicator tells us, uh, Dave Scott will remove the tunnel, go up into the tunnel area, and visually check each one of the latches. And if they're not made it automatically, he can mate them uh, in a manual configuration. At that altitude and that speed, they certainly better have a good catch to make sure everything goes. What's the, uh, what's the maximum speed uh, tolerable there, uh, Leo, for that docking? Uh... Well, the limits, uh, Walter, are from 0.1 to 1 foot per second at contact. However, in this particular docking that we're going to be doing today, the uh, S-4B will be 150,000 pounds heavier than normal since it has not done the translunar injection burn. So I'm sure Dave is going to go in very cautiously, and he'll probably dock at about 0.25 feet per second in order to keep the structural loads down, since both vehicles will be heavier than normal. That's about equivalent of, uh, oh, 18 hundredths of a mile per hour, I think. That's pretty slow, but uh, and once he gets contact, then he'll go ahead and and thrust with his uh, reaction control systems to push the probe into the drogue to make sure it doesn't bounce out. That's and so he can slow. hit within a foot of this funnel, and he'll go down into the hole and engage the capture latches. That's so slow that I doubt that Bill Stout could uh, hold his balance uh, walking that slowly. Well, we have Bill strapped in the seat this morning, so he can't fall out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have you back with us, Leo, on you, uh, the flight of Apollo 9. The weather is certainly not very good down here, but the count is going on, and uh, there is not supposed to be any weather uh, constraint to the flight. It's T minus 21 minutes and counting. In uh, our CBS News weather uh, headquarters, weather consultant Gordon Barnes there in New York can perhaps tell us even more about the weather than we can tell out our window here. Gordon? Waller, in the immediate Cape Kennedy area, the clouds are going to remain with you throughout the entire launch. There's also a light, small area of light rain and light rain showers just to the east of you over the Atlantic Ocean. There's a good chance that some of those will move in over you between 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock. 
But the recovery aboard Air New Bermuda is really having some rough weather. A major storm that has dumped some 4 to 25 inches of snow in the New York area during the past 24 hours is touching off a rather heavy rain squall activity and rough seas in that particular portion of the recovery zone. Seas are running some 10 to 15 feet high and winds 30 to 40 miles per hour. In fact, at the next recovery aboard area in the South Atlantic, the weather is not even that much better. Uh, uh, skies are cloudy in that area, scattered rain showers and seas running some four to seven feet. And all I can say to you at this point is um, when you come back to New York, we'll have your snow shovel waiting for you, Walter. Are we going to be able to land there later this afternoon? Uh, yes, both Kennedy and LaGuardia airports are reporting uh, fairly good conditions at this time. They have approximately one inch of snow on the runways, but they'll have it cleared for you later today. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Speaking about that weather downrange where the USS Guadalcanal helicopter landing ship is standing by to recover the astronauts after splashdown a week from Thursday. And CBS News correspondent Murray Frompson is on board the ship to report that event. Yesterday, he sent us this report on our crew's preparations. The Guadalcanal is a primary recovery ship, and for the past several days, we've been maneuvering southwest of Bermuda. Helicopter crews, frogmen, and medical teams have been running through a series of drills, using this model to simulate the actual recovery of Apollo 9. Those drills have been quite a challenge, conducted in choppy seas with high swells and waves, brisk winds, and some rain. One frogman lost his scuba tank, a shark had to be chased away by an alert helicopter pilot, and before this model could be retrieved, it was banged against the side of the Guadalcanal by the high waves, and the frogmen had to leap clear. When the flight of Apollo 9 ends, the work of the Guadalcanal will just begin. Minutes before splashdown, the helicopters will take off and try to locate the honing signal being transmitted from the spacecraft. When they do, hopefully near this ship, the frogmen will start a series of procedures they've practiced so long to perfect. They'll put an anchor on the spacecraft, then place a flotation collar around it to prevent it from capsizing, and only then look into the welfare of the astronauts. If the team leader of the divers signals a thumbs up, that means the astronauts are safe and well. If, however, he signals a cross wrists, that means a doctor is needed immediately from the helicopter hovering just above. But everyone here optimistically predicts a flawless recovery and the safe return of the spacecraft to this deck. Because the launch of Apollo 9 was delayed, the Guadalcanal has been forced to sail back and forth in or near the recovery area. It's a good thing the space agency isn't paying by the mile, for as it turns out in the curious logic and bookkeeping of Washington, in effect, NASA is paying rent for this ship to the U.S. Navy. Murray Frompson, CBS News, aboard the USS Guadalcanal. And the count is T-minus 17 minutes and 50 seconds and counting. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 will continue in a moment. Your family doctor sees something unusual. He wants to check with a heart specialist a thousand miles away. So with a medical data set made by Western Electric, your cardiogram instantly appears before the distant specialist for his analysis. Data speeds from machine to machine, and doctor talks to doctor over regular telephone lines to save time, to save lives. Western Electric makes other data phone data sets. So your Bell Telephone Company can serve you in other ways, too. Like helping banks rush data to give you faster service. Helping airlines to request and confirm your reservations in seconds. Making data phone data sets to move information at the speed of light is one of Western Electric's jobs as manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system. Back here at the... Kennedy Space Center waiting for the launch of Apollo 9, scheduled in 16 minutes from now, and the count is proceeding. A quick review, this is a 10-day Earth orbital mission around 150 miles up, the most complex mission yet planned by the uh, space program, this to test the lunar module, the little landing craft that will take men from the the command ship circling the moon down to the moon's surface and back in the eventual moon landing mission. Now perhaps plan for July, if this mission goes well. If this mission does not go well, the entire moon landing program will have to be set back. 
uh, the length of time depending upon the problems that develop on this particular mission. This is the first manned test of the lunar module, and once those big boosters you see there, the five F-1 engines at the base of the Saturn rocket boost that 6,600,000 pounds into orbit and to a 17,500 mile an hour speed it takes to balance delicately between gravity and a flight on into space. Well, they will separate and uh, the lunar module will be tested with man in it for the first time. It's only flown once before, unmanned, this time manned flight. And the men who will take it uh, away from the command ship a uh, hundred miles away and will have to bring it back because otherwise they won't make it back to Earth themselves. And on the fourth day of this mission, uh, Rusty Schweikert will make a spacewalk, two hours and 15 minutes. He will uh, leave the lunar module and uh, as it is docked to the command ship, cross back to the command ship, climb into the hatch, and then back to the lunar module. To prove, uh, first of all, of the new life support equipment he'll be wearing on his back, the life support equipment that provides oxygen and cooling water and communications equipment for the walk on the moon. And this will be the first time it will be tested by man in space. He'll also be proving out a capable emergency system that could take, that could provide for man to leave the lunar module and get back to the command ship without going through the docking tunnel between them, should that tunnel for any reason be blocked. For instance, should it be damaged in docking. The entire flight to take nine days, 22 hours and 47 minutes, the splashdown to come a week from Thursday morning, 185 miles southwest of Bermuda. The astronauts have their own views, of course, of each of the flights in which they're assigned. And David Schumacher in New York has talked to the astronauts, uh, their view of this flight. All their attention inevitably is focused on spacecraft commanders, McDivitt in this case, or space walkers like Rusty Schweiker. My own candidate, however, for crew, critical crew member, is the man on the middle couch, Dave Scott. McDivitt apparently agrees, for he's insisted that Scott perform the very first docking with the LEM so that he'll have had some practice for that just in case later, in case of an emergency when he'd have to perform it alone. Throughout rendezvous, Scott has to fly the spacecraft, track the LEM, and keep new figures in his computers in case a rescue becomes necessary. Scott also does a lot of the physical work, assembling and disassembling hatches, probes, and drogues every time his colleagues want to move back and forth between the command module and the lunar module. Finally, Scott has to be able to fly re-entry alone in the event of a major tragedy forcing him to abandon his fellow astronauts in space. It's a lot of responsibility, but Scott is a cool customer, even by West Point standards, and Schweikert and McDivitt trust him, as they made clear in an interview. I sure am. If I wasn't confident, we'd have Dave train more. <laughs> now, we're... I think we have a mutual confidence within the crew and the uh, abilities of the other people, and we have a, the same kind of confidence in the ground in them being able to supply the spacecraft with the knowledge that they need to do the mission successfully. Or are you confident that Dave Scott can handle this by himself? We, we spend uh, a lot of time training for this, and Dave, uh, of course, during the simulations now, we have all these failures. Uh, the LEM just, both spacecraft in these simulations just about fall apart at the seams so that you're always fixing this, that, or the other thing. And as a result, when you get to the flight, uh, it's such a pleasure because you're flying around and everything isn't going wrong, you know. And of course, that's why we simulate that way, because we're always ready to handle any of these emergencies which come up and still safely return to the command module and, and in the end, safely return to Earth. But Scott, uh, that's who holds this critical role of command module pilot, is 36 years old. Uh, he was born in San Antonio, Texas. Both his father and his father-in-law are retired Air Force generals. He himself was fifth in a class of 633 at West Point, and then went on to get a master's degree at MIT. Uh, he flew on the Gemini 8 mission back in March of 1966, and if you'll remember, that was the mission uh, that he was supposed to make a spacewalk on, but instead uh, a thruster got stuck, it went into an uncontrolled tumbling, and the men had to make corrections and get themselves back safely to Earth. They did and got right back to the uh, impact point that they themselves had calculated and predicted out in the Pacific for a 
the first safe return after a serious emergency in space. He has two children, Tracy and seven, and Douglas, five. The other uh, man on this crew uh, might give you a quick personal rundown, Jim McDivitt, 39 years old, also a Air Force uh, colonel. He was a pilot in the Korean War and a uh, test pilot, as all of these fellows have been before becoming an astronaut. He went to the University of Michigan and was first in his class there. All of these fellows are extraordinary brains. And he flew uh, on a Gemini 4 mission. He was the pilot when Ed White made his spacewalk, the first American spacewalk. He has four children, Michael 11, and 10, Patrick 8, and Kathleen 2. His parents live in Jackson, Michigan. He was born in Chicago. And the lunar module pilot, Russell Schweiker, is 33 years old. Uh, he was in the Air National Guard and served uh, active duty with the Air Force, but he's now a civilian. He got both his bachelor's and master's of science degrees at MIT, uh, and with a distinguished uh, record there. This is his first space flight. And he has five children, Vicki, nine, twins, Randolph and Russell, eight, Ellen, seven, Diana, four. Born in Neptune, New Jersey, as folks live in Seagirt. New Jersey. Incidentally, all of the wives and children of the astronauts are in Houston, Texas, watching this flight by television and their special uh, uh, public uh, amplifier lash up that they've got uh, with the Space Center at Houston. We frequently talked about the dangers of space flight, and now with just nine minutes to go to this one, uh, we've been uh, reminded of them uh, more than one occasion on this flight. The astronauts, of course, more aware than we are. And earlier this month, David Shoemacher asked Apollo 9's commander, Jim McDivitt, how he assesses the risk of this flight. Well, a lot of people have asked me about what I think of the risk on the mission. Uh, everything one does is risky. Now, the chances of success are between different things are, are different. I think my, ch my chances of success of walking down the hall are pretty good. I think my chances of success of, of driving home are a little bit less than that, but pretty good. I think my chances of flying from here to the Cape or the Cape someplace else are pretty good. And I think my chances of flying this mission successfully are pretty good. Now, everything is uh, relatively a little more risky or dangerous or has a little less chance of success than the previous one. Um, obviously, there's not a 100% chance of this mission being successful, and we all know that. Now, what that chance is, I don't know. I'm prepared to to fly the mission. I think that it will be successful. If I knew of any one reason that it wouldn't be, we'd go fix it, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think that uh, we're all mentally and morally prepared to accept the challenge and go off and do it. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 will continue in a moment. traffic network in this country where there are almost never any traffic jams. The Bell Telephone Network, with equipment made and supplied by Western Electric. Oh, the Bell System Network has traffic problems, too, like over 300 million phone calls a day. But there are millions of routes to choose from, and they're switching equipment to get you through. I'm glad I got through so fast. I'll never make that plane. You wouldn't believe there's traffic. Bumper to bumper. Western Electric. We make Bell telephones. We also make equipment for the network that keeps your phone calls from getting stuck in traffic. Western Electric. Manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system. CBS News coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 continues after this pause for station identification. important vehicle called the Lunar Module, or the LEM. It's a tale of two spacecraft this morning, these two spacecraft. The Apollo itself, referred to as the gumdrop, as you said earlier, Frank, on this mission, and the Lunar Module, called the Spider, 
This morning, attempting its first manned flight, its second uh, flight all told. The LEM must prove itself on this flight if we're to get to the moon this summer, or perhaps even get to the moon uh, at all this year. Weighing 32,000 pounds, most of that weight fuel, the LEM has two main engines, a descent stage, the descent stage right here, which has to lower the LEM to the moon's surface with the two astronauts aboard, and an ascent stage, which separates the descent stage, stays behind on the moon as kind of a launch pad all by itself. The ascent stage takes off to bring the two astronauts back up to the Apollo command module orbiting the moon, the mothership. They transfer back to the Apollo command module for the long trip back to Earth.